Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Again, second time today. That's right. I mean, these were some pretty exciting missions. I'm finally back in the studio, not traveling for once, uh, working on videos, doing a lot of really fun stuff. And I figure, you know, these Rocket Lab recovery missions are awesome. I love to see this progress. I was going to be watching this launch anyway. I was probably going to be, if I'm being honest, I was going to be watching this launch from the comfort of my own bed. Uh, but I figure... We should, we should just stream again. So this is a, a bit of a last minute stream here for me, but I hope you guys are, a lot of you I see are from, you know, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Europe waking up. I don't know if there's too many people in the US staying up this late, but if you are, say hi. Uh, thank you for guys, for tuning in. So let's just, let's just dive right into this. Why don't we, uh, why don't we see what we're gonna be seeing today? Because it's quite exciting, obviously. You know, I like to stream often. I like to stream bigger, more important and fun missions and just kind of generally cool things. And this this ticks this ticks a lot of those boxes. It's very cool and, and fun and exciting. So, uh, anytime you have uh, questions about any rocket launch and any upcoming launch, of course, you can go to everydayastronaut.com, click click on upcoming launches, and there you're going to find a little web page like this, little article like this. Uh, this one is for today's mission, which is four of a kind. So this is going to be taking off on January 31st for most of the world, including me actually right on the, like I'm 15 minutes after midnight when this thing will go off tonight. You do see uh, on the left hand side, top left of your screen, you will see we have the launch window uh, up there. It is a, I believe it's, what is it? A 45 minute launch window, if I remember right. Uh, it's not, a, it's not a super long launch window. Um, but yeah, so it's, yeah, 45 minute launch window. It gives them 45 minutes to get this thing off the ground and flying. Uh, but it's going to be taking off here in 28 minutes. Uh, the mission name, Four of a Kind. Launch provider, the, the company that is launching this rocket is Rocket Lab. The customer who's paying for this, the people that want these their satellites in space, in this case, are... <laughs> I almost said Rocket Lab again. Spire Global for North Star. The rocket, in this case, the only one flying currently with Rocket Lab is the Electron rocket. Although they are working on their Neutron rocket. Uh, I like to, that's another reason why I like to watch these uh, these Rocket Lab live, live streams. Is sometimes you just get little tidbits of information, uh, uh, upcoming information about Neutron and just other fun things they're working on. So that's one of the main reasons I love to tune in to Rocket Lab's live streams. Uh, the launch location for this is Launch Complex 1B. There are two pads out here at, at Launch Complex in the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand. The payload mass for this, these guys are tiny. They're 24 kilograms for all four of them. Uh, where are they going? They are going to a 530 kilometer low Earth orbit at a 97 degree inclination, which would be uh, SSO, so Sun Synchronous Orbit, or more or less like a around there. That's technically uh, retrograde. Do you 90? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Slightly retrograde. Uh, will they be attempting to recover the first stage? Yes. This is one of the only other pre-launch previews you'll see on our website that says yes when they're trying to recover uh, first stage because they do. They do recover. And in this case, they Rocket Lab recovers it using a parachute and it splashes down in the Pacific Ocean for marine recovery. I also have some good news. I am hearing the Rocket Lab stream starting up. Uh, give me one second. I'm going to kind of cut over to that real quick and make sure we are good to go on that end um, when it is go time. I'll try and fly through the rest of this pre-launch preview just so we can uh, get to the stream and we can listen to Rocket Lab. I'm going to kind of just shut up and listen. We'll watch together and we'll answer questions when there's time. So stick around. All right, so this uh, it will softly splash down for an ocean recovery. Will there be attempt to recover the fairings? Nope, that's not something that Rocket Lab does so far. This is the first Rocket Lab launch of the year, first Electron launch of the year, 10th launch from the Launch Complex 1B, the, the other pad, the 43rd Electron launch, the 9th recovery attempt of an Electron altogether, the 22nd orbital launch attempt of 2024 already. So yeah, the, the, and here's the satellites that are going to be launching are these four of a kind um, for Spire Global, these little itty bitty guys. Um, the lemur, the uh, deploy four six kilogram low earth orbit multi-use receivers or lemurs. So check that out. Uh, this article was written. We got more information on here about the recovery and how this will all work and the times. Uh, this article was written by Flo. So everyone say thank you to Flo for writing an awesome article, uh, Florian. So there you guys go. Um, I'm not sure we're getting something up there. Let me make sure. Um, and yeah, and also one more time. I know some of you probably didn't see the thing this morning necessarily there's probably some overlap but i did want to let you know we have our biggest sale we're closing out a ton of of classic shirts including the f1 shirt that i'm wearing 50 percent off we are clearing up inventory making room for new stuff 
Uh, we have a lot of awesome new merch coming. So if you want some classics, the F1 shirt, the Aero Spike shirt, the full flow stage combustion cycle hoodie. We sold out of the classic one, uh, the classic t-shirt. Normal shirt, lunar t-shirt, the RS25 shirt. I mean, these are some major names here. Uh, everything in our RUD section is 50% off. We are trying to, we have a lot of inventory that we're closing out on. Uh, these are just kind of the final runs. Sizes might be limited, but if you have thought about getting something, now is probably a good time. This is the best time to grab, grab that stuff. And we also do have a new sale as well. Uh, we're also trying to clear up a few more of our Falcon 9 model rockets. Uh, this is likely our last run on the Falcon 9s. Um, we've been sitting on this inventory for a little bit, so they are also on sale. So everydayastronaut.com slash shop, grab something while it's there. This stuff won't last. We, uh, we need to, we have other stuff that has sold out, but it got cleared out of here, but I should put the other stuff that's sold out because it's, it's selling quickly. So, um, so get on that while you can everydayastronaut.com slash shop, uh, shop around and, and that always supports what I do here and, uh, and helps this whole thing keep going. And I can't wait for you guys to see the upcoming video we're working on. I think like this is the... The thing that I always say is like, I promise this next video we're working on, it has some of the coolest uh, graphics and animations. Casper's been doing some amazing things. Uh, our team's just been producing an incredible video. Deep dive, lots of numbers, comparisons, hypothetical situations, really cool concept of why don't we use have a better launch vehicle? Why are we still using rocket engines? Um, you know, why aren't we using air breathing engines? And why aren't we using, uh, you know, launching rockets from from giant air breathing, you know, supersonic SR seventy ones or something, you know, uh, and and why aren't we using a yeeter to yeet the rocket off the pad? Uh, a lot of fun stuff. So get ready for that. We're hoping to have that done by next the end of next week. We're making serious progress. We're about halfway done. So get ready. Get ready to be excited. It's about time we do some cool stuff. Besides, I mean, I feel like we're always doing cool stuff. Honestly, a lot of it's just behind the scenes. I just love. I love making videos and I'm glad that we have some awesome, I mean, there's like, we have three videos currently in the works at the moment and I'm really excited about that. That is awesome. So, all right, let's, uh, let's answer a few questions, guys. We've got a queue up here and, you know, of course, as always, if you have a question and you, you know, you don't have to super chat to get up here, we'll just pull some good questions in here. Uh, but currently I do see that RC Horseman became a member. I really appreciate that. Um, we also have, uh... We have Rick saying, up late in Memphis, uh, my daughter and her husband attended Astro Awards and they were thrilled to meet you. That is awesome, Rick. That is very, very, very cool. Um, the Astro Awards was just honestly one of the most fun weekends I've had in a long time. Went surprisingly smooth for a first time event. Um, so excited about, about just that idea that people were just so thrilled to finally do something like this, like to recognize the people behind these incredible missions. And uh, you know, I think Rocket Lab is, is likely going to win an Astro Award this year. You know, if they do something awesome, depending on what that is. I, we're going to make the, the Astro Award nominations and the people that receive awards, I think we're going to trim it down a little bit. Like, I think we're going to make it even more prestigious. Like, it's like a big deal if you win an Astro Award. Like, we'll try to keep it to 10 altogether. Something like six generic Astro Awards in the top four for inspirational, innovative, and important and then the overall most innovative inspirational and important mission of the year so we'll see rocket lab i think to to really get on that train nowadays i think you got to do like they'd have to probably refly a booster i think that would get them on that list but yeah uh a whole booster they are working on a lot of cool things obviously and and i really am excited of course for neutron and when neutron starts flying that's going to be game changing and absolutely awesome to see so Astro Joe, awesome, 13 months of membership, woohoo, I get to use uh, another monthly, thanks Tim, and thank you Astro Joe for hanging out, good to, good to see you, and see you, in, and also awesome seeing you in Discord as well. Uh, let's see, this um, Devil's Light Beam, is there a theoretical upper limit to the power of chemical engines? There's a lot of ways to answer this, and from my knowledge, so there's, there's always, okay, so I guess, you know, when you talk about like, are you talking about total thrust output of like a single engine? Are we talking about chemical rockets as far as their, and when we say, you know, theoretical upper limit of the power of chemical engines, are we talking about theoretical efficiency? Like well, the metric of power here is, is, you know, are we talking about total work, like workload? Are we talking about, you know, how much Delta V can you get out of a chemical system? I mean, of course, there's there's practical limits more so than theoretical. You know what I mean? It's like you can scale up a rocket engine to increase the power, but you start to run into a lot of problems. Combustion instability probably being the biggest. 
um, you start to run into just scaling issues of now how do you move these giant engines around and install them and, and blah 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 what happens when something goes wrong etc cetera, etc cetera. um you know as far as delta v sure you know if you wanted to if you wanted to build you know a like a, i'm trying to think of insane numbers a thousand meter tall uh you know a thousand meter wide I don't know, just a giant cube uh of rocket propellant with enough energy whatever some insanely like we'll say a thousand times bigger than than starship right um there's nothing theoretically holding that back. It's just a practical thing. You know, it's like, so I, I don't quite know how to answer that. Yes, there's, but yeah. And, and also same with, with ISP, with specific, specific impulse, you do run into a limit on, uh, on, you know, like pressure, you run into a limit on how much you, your expansion ratio, uh, you can only accelerate a molecule so fast. And I don't know what that limit is. Um, I don't know if you start to run into some kind of thermal limit or something like that. Um, but yeah, there are, there are some limits. I don't know what they are, but a lot of them are practical. I hope that answers it. I don't know if I did. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, Jeff Reddy says, how much payload capacity is sacrificed by reusing electrons first stage? So, so far, uh, it's, it's not as much as say a Falcon nine, which, which has to reserve a lot of propellant because the, the electron more or less burns through all of its propellant coasts back and then just kind of re-enters just hope it has a low enough you know dry mass and uh that it it just can handle re-entry and they have a big enough heat shield and stuff so the only real considerations are a little bit beefier heat shield some thermal considerations on the rocket um the parachute recovery system and those all together add up to something like if i remember right these may have changed uh you know right now electron can take about 300 kilograms to orbit I think when you recover, you're limited more to like 200 or 225, just adding those. But the thing is, let's say you add 100 kilograms to your first stage and you burn all the way through your propellant. You don't lose 100 kilograms of payload capacity. You actually lose only about 25 kilograms. It's like a four to one-ish mass penalty on the booster versus, um, yeah, bur uh, on the booster versus the upper stage. On the upper stage, it's a one to one. If you add a kilogram of mass to your upper stage, you will lose a kilogram of payload capacity. That's just the way that works out because that goes all the way up into orbit. Ooh, the stream is starting. Uh, as soon as they actually start talking, I'll, I'll shut up and we'll listen together. And we'll, again, um, well, last one here from North Advantage. We likely are retiring the Falcon 9 models after they sell out or maybe doing one final run, depending. I mean, it might not be a bad idea to have them, you know, in, in stock. We, we've talked about, like, selling them in stores and stuff, but I don't know. They're probably too niche for that. Um, but as of now, these are our last runs, so get them while you can. Um, we have some awesome questions on Brandon Meyer. Um, thanks Simon team question. Can members gift memberships? I don't see the option. Is my TV just being weird tonight or is that by design? I have never turned that on. I'll look into it. Thank you so much. That is very generous. I'll look into it. I'll look into it for you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to be quiet though and listen to the stream. Let's listen in and we'll get back to your ans answering your questions when there's a break. Welcome to Rocket Lab's 43rd Electron Launch, a dedicated mission for Spire and North Star called Four of a Kind. It's our first launch of the new year from Rocket Lab Launch Complex 1 in Mahia, New Zealand. And on your screen right now is a live view of our Electron Rocket for today's mission. My name is Muriel Baker. Thank you for joining us for this Why? next Electron Launch. And I'm proud to It is so great to be back earlier. and straight okay, into launch. Right now. My bad. One second. Here from the camera on board our recovery boat stationed out in the Pacific Pacific, we left off before the rocket's first stage returns to the recovery ops are so far on track for our scheduled liftoff time at 722. Whoa. And if you're in the U.S., that means you know 11, what? Why is that sorry, 1.22 a.m. EST or 10.22 p.m. PST. Great. Something else changed. Uh, <laughs> today's better, primary mission is to deliver four satellites to low Earth orbit. Now, these space situational awareness satellites will be operated so by Spire for North Star Earth and Space, a company that monitors space traffic and debris to enable safe navigation in Earth orbit. They detect and track objects in space to issue proximity alerts and help other space users maneuver and avoid collisions. 
For more about their mission, here is North Star Earth and Space. We got some housekeeping to take care of. Okay, for some reason, their stream is 10 decibels louder than what we were streaming earlier with, with NASA. Uh, we're also going to try and not cover up their, uh, their thing so we can actually see it. And it'll be all good. One second here. All right, so let's let's fix this. We also should fix the time. Holy cow, because they moved the time back eight minutes and 30, 30 seconds. Eight minutes and 30 seconds. So that's going to be 23.30. 23.30. Let's see how close we are. And push. We're a touch behind, so I'm just going to remove, like, oh, there we go. Let's see it. I'll bet you I nailed it. Now we're a little ahead. Sorry, this is like the, the old game of watch Tim try to align the clock. It'll be good enough now. And we'll get back into answering questions, because I'm sure that's not a, a very fun thing to watch for a stream. I'm positive of that, actually. All right. Uh, let's see. This is from... Uh, from Mr. Space Repair, uh, nine months ago, Starship launch, and during that live stream, I got a membership. That's awesome. Thank you for nine months of membership. That was an exciting launch. We're coming up on IFT3. That's also going to be huge, literally. So, yeah, thank you. Today's payload consists of Spire's four lemur satellites, which are headed to a 530-kilometer sun-synchronous orbit at a 97-degree inclination. Each of the four lemurs, which stands for Low Earth Multi-Use Receiver, will form part of Spire's already existing constellation of nanosatellites in LEO. They'll be launched today from LC-1 Pad B, our second launch pad at Launch Complex 1. We've conducted most of our electron launches from LC-1 over the years, and both pads A and B are expecting a busy year of back-to-back -back launches, along with missions scheduled from our Launch Complex 2 in Virginia throughout 2024. The Electron rocket carrying today's Spire payloads is a three-stage liquid-fueled launch vehicle designed specifically for small satellite missions needing a dedicated ride to space. Electron is made from carbon composite, a strong but lightweight structural material that gives our rocket its unique black look. Electron is white on the outside, though, because of the super cold locks that runs through its propellant tanks, which causes moisture to condense as ice on the rocket. And for recovery missions like today's, particularly on Electron's first stage, the rocket actually looks silver. And that's because the first stage is covered in a silvery TPS or thermal protection system material, which helps Electron's first stage survive its return to Earth after launch. There are 10 Rutherford engines. Okay, genuinely love everything they're talking about right now, but I gotta, I gotta recognize this real quick. This is too big. Scott Prombo. Hey, Tim, I don't know if you recall, but my dad and I chatted with you at Hopper House after IFT when I do absolutely recall. He still talks about how cool it was to chat with you to this day. Made our week. Thanks for being a real one. I really appreciate hearing that, Scott. Thank you so You, You don't have to do that. Thank you so much, though. I mean, sincerely, I hope that you're proud of the work we're doing here, and it's all thanks to uh, to people like you making this all possible. So thank you so, so much. Everyone, everyone in Discord, or I mean, not Discord, well, also in Discord, uh, please say thank you to Scott. That is incredible. So insanely generous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Maybe we'll see you again. Come to Astro Awards next year. Let's hang out Yeah, that's crazy. Thank you so much. All right, let's listen in. This is awesome stuff But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 24 kilonewtons of thrust at liftoff While the second stage's Rutherford engine is capable of about 25.8 kilonewtons of thrust and that's not all. There's actually an 11th engine on Electron called the Curie engine, which sits on top of our second stage and powers the kick stage. In the simplest form, the kick stage serves as in-space propulsion to deploy the satellites attached to it to orbit. It gets the satellites precisely where they need to go, whether it's across multiple trajectory changes on a rideshare mission or to a very specific or difficult to reach point in space that can only be achieved on a dedicated ride. The brilliant thing about the kick stage's ability to relight its engine is that it can then send itself on a deorbit path once the mission's done, helping to minimize space junk in orbit. Now, when it comes to recovery missions, there are additions to Electron that we should point out as well. 
Attached inside the first stage, where that red band is below the second stage, are two sets of parachutes to help Electron return to Earth for recovery. When the first and the second stage split apart, while the second stage continues the mission to orbit, the separated first stage makes its way back to Earth. It maintains its trajectory on an arc, keeping that red end facing upward so that the heavier end of the first stage, where the engines are, leads the way back home. Now, once Electron is back through Earth's atmosphere, the first drogue chute will be deployed from the first stage to help slow it down. Then we'll have the release of the second main parachute, also attached internally to that first stage, which really decelerates the speed of the first stage ahead of it landing softly in the ocean for collection by our recovery vessel and our ocean crew. I love the little red for some reason. I think the red adds a lot to it. Also, we should probably do a real quick pointy end up flaming it down check. I can confirm by visual assessment, ocular assessment, an ocular pat down of the situation that that is pointy end up flaming it down. Very clear on this rocket. Quite a pointy end. It's quite a pointy nose. I love this vehicle. And it is fun to remember, it's not very big. Like, it's it's pretty small, you know, and uh, I uh, someday I hope to have it in scale with all of our other rockets. I think that'll be awesome to see the Electron um, along with the others, but yeah, it's a very, very cool rocket. And again, they were talking about on the stream a little bit earlier, but I got distracted because of some incredible generosity. Uh, but the, you know, it is fun to see that this rocket, this one's particularly painted silver to have thermal co uh, thermal protection barrier on the booster so it can re-enter and survive that re-entry phase. But you'll notice that it mostly looks white and normally this rocket's all black. And then these recoverable ones have that red inner stage, red for recovery, I love that. Um, and then normally on the pad as it stands right now, it would all be black when it's unfueled, but as soon as they get propellant on board. Bringing you a quick update from Mission Control here. The launch director has adjusted today's T0 time to allow just a little bit of extra time for sensor data to come up to temperature. The new T0 time is now 0634 UTC, approximately 30 minutes from now. Cool. All right, well, our, our clocks are... Oh, they updated it again. I see why they said that. All right, back to the game of watch Tim adjust stuff. Wait, 30, didn't they say, oh, 30, okay. So we gotta just do one of these. Let's see how, how close I am now. This will be interesting. Boom, boom, boom. Hey. Okay, they just added 10 minutes to the clock. That's, that one's easy. That one's easy. Okay, but as I was saying, you know, the rocket normally is just sitting there and it's, and it's black. Uh, the reason that it looks white and black now, again, this is a common fact for those of us that are frequent to this stuff, but it's still just one of those things that when you think about it, it's like, that is actually crazy. Where it's white, it's white just because the propellant inside is liquid oxygen, which is so cold. It's sitting there. It's so cold. We have 28 minutes left on the clock as our team works towards that new target time of 1934 local time for liftoff. Meanwhile, our recovery operators are also ready and waiting for today's launch and their latest attempt at bringing Electron back to Earth from space after liftoff. You can see the live feed from the camera on board our recovery vessel on your left-hand side there. This is all part of our plan to make Electron the world's first reusable orbital small rocket. Because if we can reuse our rockets instead of building brand new ones every time, then reusable rockets will help bring down the cost of space access and open up even more launch opportunities for satellite operators on Electron. First, of course, we need to bring back Electron's first stage from space after liftoff. So here's more on how we plan to do that. Okay, uh, sadly, I think they, they could have used uh, copyright protected music. So I, I'm, I am gonna mute that, unfortunately. Because you never know. Uh, but, okay, I want to get back to the thing that I keep talking about. Wait, what? How did Nightbot just end up? What? <laughs> Why did Nightbot end up on air? What's happening? How did that happen? Did it? <laughs> what? Okay, sorry. As I was saying, the rocket's filled with, uh, there's, uh, you know, it's got RP-1, which is kerosene, which is more or less at room temperature, right? And then you have liquid oxygen, which is, uh, it's cryogenic. So in order to make oxygen into a liquid, you have to cool it down to minus 100 and whatever, 80 degrees Celsius-ish. And you have to cool it down. And it's so cold that as it sits inside the tanks, and the tanks on the electron are carbon fiber, so carbon composite. So, you know, they're, uh, they're relatively thin. And despite that, despite the fact that those are obviously, 
you know, pretty thin and there's just all this liquid propellant inside. The outside skin gets so cold that that it will uh, just turns all the humidity and all the moisture in the atmosphere into ice and it turns and sticks into ice on the outside. By the way, we are seeing the reentry profile here of the electron. So they just, after stage separation, it just falls back. They do orient it with some cold gas thrusters so that it stays engines first. And they just, they basically just pencil dive in through the atmosphere. The exact opposite of what we saw this morning on this morning's Falcon 9 launch where they angle it to try to utilize as much of the vehicle to slow down as much as possible so it has less work to do for its propulsive landing. Electron's designed just to simply be able to handle the high heat loads of, of re-entry, which is really cool. So uh, yeah, then they just go and recover it from a ship. They, they've done some waterproofing of the booster and try to make it so it can handle the salt water submersion for a little bit. And then they, uh, they go and recover the booster. So hopefully, hopefully, minutes after splash on is what they're saying. I hope that they can actually refly a booster this way. I think that'd be really, really cool. It'd be awesome. I would love just for fun if they just took it and just put it out on a stand and just tried to run it right away. Like, see what happens. You know, it would have normally been expended. Don't do any like analytics. Don't do any analysis of it. Just, just fire it up. That would be. I would be very curious what would happen. Of today's recovery attempt will, of course, determine our next steps towards the ultimate goal, which is to refurbish and refly an entire electron first stage on a future flight. Now, while the video didn't mention it, we have reflown some pretty significant hardware on our most recent recovery missions, including a Stage 1 Rutherford engine. The engine first launched on our 26 electron mission called There and Back Again in May of 2022. After it was brought back from the ocean to our factory, the engine went through testing and qualification hot fires to make sure that it was ready to launch again. We then added it to the power pack of our 40th mission called We Love the Nightlife, where it performed as well as any newly built Rutherford engine that we've launched before. Its performance for that mission was validation that some of our most crucial hardware can be launched again and again. And so we can't wait to see how the team builds on today's recovery mission to get us closer to relaunching an Electron first stage in its entirety. I love that. I want them to relaunch a first stage in its entirety. If we have, if this is a break, I would love to answer some questions for you guys. I see some really, really good ones that I'm excited to answer. But for now, I'm always nervous to start talking because then they might start talking. Um, let's start off with, if we got time, let's try it. Let's try squeezing this one in. Do I think that SpaceX should build a Methane Falcon 9? No. That would, uh, changing propellant is not just some like, oh, just switch some tanks around. It'd be a completely new rocket. And every, every aspect, the Merlin engine would have to be redesigned and the turbo pump assembly would be completely different because the densities are different of, of methane versus RP-1. You have a lot more considerations with it being cryogenic on, on both the fuel and the oxidizer. Uh, you know, if Merlin re-changes its design, you, you're, re, you're, you're changing everything. You're literally, quite literally changing everything. You're not just simply changing the, the bulkhead where it sits between the, the fuel and oxidizer because of the mass, the, the volume ratios and the density of the propellants and blah, 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 blah. You're literally changing everything. At that point, it's no longer a Falcon 9. It's a completely different rocket. So if you're starting from scratch already, even if you're trying to keep it as simple as you can, it's still a massive redesign. And you look at it and go, okay, what's that going to do for us? Maybe in a world with, if you're using the same architecture, you, you might slightly increase performance with a, a Merlin. Uh, but you actually might lose performance. I mean, honestly, you know, methane is less dense. You'll actually get less potential work out of the same, if you have the same volume of tankage, you'll actually get less work done. But there is an efficiency gain, so it is higher performing out of the engine. So that trade-off, I'm not sure. A methane upper stage likely would be uh, beneficial. And there was kind of talks about doing something like that, but not with a... There was talks of it being a Raptor upper stage, but that'd be way too... The Merlin 1D is already way overpowered. It's like massively overpowered for an upper stage. They're already throttling that thing all the way down so they're not smushing their valuable payloads near the end of the burn. So it's already overpowered. Raptor is substantially more powerful than that. You know, it's... Uh, oh, God, I'm blanking right now. Is it three, two and a half times more powerful than a Merlin engine? So... Um, yeah, so now you're just taking that even and making that problem even worse. It's it's heavier. Uh, it would be higher performing in a vacuum, but anyway, the, the point is you're redoing a whole rocket. 
And to what cause? Like, are you now getting potentially similar performance? Maybe a tiny bit more, maybe a tiny bit less. Um, but if you're going through all the R&D and you're starting from scratch, why not go bigger? It, and Starship is, I know Starship seems obscenely big and, and it's easy to question why didn't they go, you know, more like a five meter wide If you're Starship. just tuning into the oh. live stream now, I just want to share a quick update that we've had a bit of a push to the right with the launch target time for today's mission. We're now targeting 1934 New Zealand local time or 0634 UTC. Cool. Yep, we're still we're still on for that, so that's good. Um, but yeah, so you could look at a Starship and just say that's way too big. They 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 went ridiculous on this, right? You could also look at it and say this is actually a small version of this rocket, and every other rocket that's flown to date, besides maybe the Saturn V and the N1, are small rockets. You know, like the Falcon 9. In the future, we might just go, yeah, that's a really small rocket. It's actually kind of incredible that we that we did that for so long. Um, so you can, I mean, yes, it's, it's complicated, but you, you do gain a lot of efficiency. You gain a lot in scale. So, uh, by scaling up Starship to be the size that it is, you gain a lot more, uh, a lot more performance, a lot more potential out of it being that size compared to say five meters. If there was, if it was five meters wide and they just had the inner 13 engines or whatever, uh, yeah, you'd be looking at a lot a lot, lot less powerful rocket. You know, I'm, I don't, I don't want to make up numbers here. I'll make up numbers. Screw it. Uh, let's say you just did the inner, the inner numbers uh, engines and, and just scaled the whole thing down. Propulsively landing, the upper stage might be a little bit harder. Fitting in the same number of RVACs would be difficult, all those things. A lot of considerations there. Now, watching a rocket launch is a spectacular experience. I'm going to say it would only do like 40 tons or something reusable or 30 tons reusable. I think it'd be a pretty major major hit opportunity to do just that we're hiring across our electron team right now and the kind of experience we're looking for might surprise you as it was sitting on the pad just okay again there, there might be copyright music so so back to this whole hypothetical situation you just really do increase your margins when when you scale things up your things like you know your flight avionics package is going to be the same mass whether it's on a small sat rocket or whether it's on starship so if you consider the dry mass of a vehicle, and let's say you have 100 kilograms of flight computers and, and avionics, that's fixed. So 100 kilograms to electron is like, you know, it's a third of the payload panel, a third of the payload mass. 100 grams on Starship is a sneeze. You know, it's, it's, it's almost negligible, right? So you, you do gain some, some efficiencies when you scale up. And also, we talked about it earlier on the other stream, but, you know, when you uh, double or when you increase... Um, the radius of a vehicle. So say you go from, or we'll say diameter, same difference. Let's say you go from five meters to nine meters. Uh, you know, you're in, your, your surface area, uh, the, the circumference goes up by the cube, whereas the volume goes up by, well, sorry, the, the circumference goes up by the square while the volume goes up by the cube. So you actually gain a lot more volume and don't have to add proportionally as much uh, mass to the skin of the vehicle. So you do gain some efficiencies by simply scaling up a rocket uh, in volume. So um, there is that consideration. Yeah, so that was a long-winded answer. Let's answer a few more <laughs> a few more questions. Uh, Buttered Up Lobster, uh, celebrating 18 months of membership, looking forward to the first full Electron Booster reuse and Archimedes engine test. Now that I'm really excited for. Going to be a big year for Rocket Lab. I really really can't wait. I think Rocket Lab is up to some really exciting things. Um, they're definitely, you know, the, the only ones that are doing what they've said so far in the, in the small set launch industry um, and just kind of knocking it out of the park. Firefly is catching up. Firefly is doing a very impressive job with, with their vehicles uh, and their program. But as far as routinely flying, Rocket Lab's still the only, the only new kid on the block that's routinely flying. So it's hard. They make it look easy. Um, this is from... Uh, Gamma Rabers says SSTO is not even that interesting. I'm not sure where that comment comes from, but I agree. Ooh, look at that Neutron hardware. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I don't think an SSTO is that interesting either. I don't, it just will never win out as far as, um, it just never went out as far as performance. Pure performance, if you're talking about the amount of propellant, especially when it starts to come into like propellant costs, the cost of actually launching a vehicle, yeah, I mean, a multi-stage vehicle will always win out, no matter what. 
There's just no getting around that. All right, let's listen in here. Maybe they'll give us some more chef to talk about. As it was sitting on the pad, just messaging mm. on oh. the phone. Like... Here we go. Maybe. Hmm. Well, I guess I'll, I'll talk over it. Where, where were we at here? All right, so uh, I'll make sure that you guys can hear them if they do. Okay, this is a, uh, could you explain sun sy synchronous 97 degree inclination for us dummies if you haven't already? So honestly, sun synchronous orbit is one of those that's a little bit hard for me to understand. But instead of flying directly 90 degrees, you know, straight over the North Pole, straight over the South Pole, just bing, bing, bing. Uh, in order to actually maintain proper orientation with the Earth rotating underneath you every day, if you want to cross the same point at the same time every day, you go into sun synchronous orbit, and that's 97 degrees, and it has something to do with, um, with what's that called? I'm angular momentum, and I I don't really know why. You just do fly slightly retrograde, and it somehow something uh, torque mm, off angle mm, dun, 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 makes it perfect. I have no idea. That's one I just I can't wrap my head around. But that's. That's what it is. Just no sun synchronous orbit. If you're flying over the same spot every day, bing, 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 um, then yeah, sun synchronous orbit. Um, yeah, I just, I just, I just don't even get it. That's I, I do have to make a video about about like all the orbits, all the different orbit types someday, where we just kind of try to explain it, and I'll do research and try to figure it out a little bit better than what I do. Um, yeah, Ben Guy, 27 months of membership, my longest running YouTube membership by far. For very Here good at reasons, T minus Hello 14 UK, minutes, 25 seconds, and counting to lift off for exactly. our 43rd Electron launch and our very first mission for 2024. Now, the weather hasn't exactly played ball with us this week, but we are happy to report conditions are much better today. And the weather team has given us the green light for both LC1 and out at the recovery zone for weather. Awesome. Love to hear it. Um, ben Guy, with your membership, by the way, you members and Patreon members and ex-subscribers, anyone that supports the channel, uh, you will be getting uh, early access and, and review access to this upcoming video, which hopefully will be early next week. We should have a draft done and basically near completed form where you can get your feedback. So pay attention to that. I always love those. The early access is, is not just meant to be like a, hey, you know, thanks. It's not only a thanks, but it's also a fun opportunity for people to get their uh, opinions in and help catch mistakes before it goes public. That, that's really important to me, to not have any mistakes. Um, James, uh, one of our <laughs> moderators, asking a question, and I think this is great. We'll throw it up on screen here. James, why doesn't Rocket Lab propulsively land their booster? Uh, so they already have such little margin with uh, being a small sat launch vehicle. Coming we're up to about 13 that. Oh. minutes to lift off and things are looking good for an on-time launch. The range is clear and ready to support. Electron and its payload are both healthy and the weather is behaving nicely so far. Now coming up very soon will be the Go No Go poll run by our launch director Joseph Carpico from Mission Control here in Auckland to determine whether to proceed with that countdown to launch. So let's listen into the comms channels for that update. This is a Go no go poll is one of the coolest parts of any rocket launch. That's undeniable. I don't know if that's happening now though. Maybe now. Um I'll talk until they start talking, so we get the go no go go poll. Uh Michael uh de Rose or DeRose. Uh, it's a bit off topic, but any chance he'll make a US uh, history of US rockets poster like he did with the Soviet Russian one. Need the pair. Yes, you do. And All yes. Operators, this is the LD on mission, well. proceeding with the go, no go sequence. Stage. Stages go. Avionics. Avionics is go. GNC. GNC is go. Beacon. Beacon is go. T1. T1 is go. GC. GC is go. PLS. PLS is go. RSO. RSO is go. Met. Met is go. RF. RF is go. MM. MM is go. Recovery. Recovery is go. LD sub. LD sub is go. That concludes the go no go sequence. We are T minus 11 minutes, 20 seconds and counting. We are go for terminal count at T minus 10 minutes. 
From this time, the three-word hold procedure is in effect. That's what we want to hear. Go across the board. That was Launch Director Joseph Carpico at the end of that Go No Go poll, confirming that the team is happy to move forward to liftoff. I want to give a special shout out to Mr. Carpico today as well, because this mission will be his 100th launch, which is just an incredible career milestone. He joined Rocket Lab with over 50 launches under his belt from his time in the US Air Force and the then Hughes Space and Communications Company, as well as launches with the Sea Launch Program and the Antares Launch Program. His contribution to our Electron launches since 2019 brings his launch tally up to 100 today, and we couldn't be prouder of Joe or more thankful for his dedication and service to the space industry. And so it's only right that he is today's launch director and whose voice you will hear behind today's 10-second launch countdown to liftoff. It's set to be a busy year of Electron launches with a sold-out 2024 launch manifest. But it is also an exciting time in our space systems businesses where we build satellites and their components from missions that make drugs in space and conduct science experiments on Mars. With more Rocket Lab spacecraft in build and backlog than ever before, this year is also set to be a mammoth year for our space systems teams across the world. Let's take a look at what they're getting up to across our facilities. This is not, this is not stock advice. This is not uh, any of that, anything, any financial advice. Uh, I, I think their space systems section of Rocket Lab will likely be uh, one of the most valuable parts of the entire company. I think the launch industry is, you know, there's a lot of people trying to do launch industry, but Rocket Lab is producing like a whole catalog of, of space flight hardware that's meant for in-space systems. And there's a lot of in-space systems that's, that's the one thing that's happening no matter what. So that, I think that's actually, pay attention to that. That's, it's really big. It's a really big deal for them, actually. We don't really talk about that a lot because it's not as visible and as obvious as seeing a rocket launch, but it is extremely important. Okay, so yes, we will be doing a U.S. rocket poster and U.S. rocket history video, a rocket engine history video, similar to uh, the Soviet rocket engine history someday. That will be, we will do that. Uh, let's, Let's uh, try to answer one more here before we get back into it. With From Nomad77CA, could Falcon Heavy launch an Orion to the moon or gateway? The simple answer is no, uh, not on its own. Uh, there's some flight profiles, and we would probably have to redo this because they keep kind of tweaking Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, getting a little more performance out of each of them. Um, there could likely be a kickstage scenario where you would do... These days, you could probably do it with a Falcon Heavy and two Falcon 9s. But it used to have to be two Falcon 9s. I think a Falcon Heavy could get it on a fairly elliptical orbit towards the moon, uh, Orion. We'd, we'd have to crunch these numbers. I'd actually be really interested now. Um, a, a fairly heavy kick stage would come up on a Falcon 9, dock to it, kick it out into translator injection. Uh, it would have to, yeah, then it would have to use its, uh, you know, the, the service module to get into to NRHO, near rectilinear halo orbit. And then, uh, or no, sorry, before you do that, though, you launch the crew on a Falcon 9, uh, up to the Orion capsule, rendezvous there, get the crew on board, and then do the TLI. So there are some profiles like that. It just doesn't have enough doesn't have enough oomph. You know that's why big rockets exist is to build a push heavy payload. So, you know uh, <laughs> it's heavy. Orion capsule is very heavy. We did those numbers or some of those numbers in our Artemis uh, rundown video, especially this. It was the second one, Artemis versus Apollo. We did a lot of the comparisons of the Orion. Uh, capsule in the program versus the Apollo program. Um, yeah. So there's your answer. Uh, from Jeff uh, Gata, thank you so much. You're welcome for the double duty. I'm just excited to be watching some awesome, some awesome launches. Let's tune back in. Contract ever, a half billion dollar agreement with the Space Development Agency to design and build 18 satellites for their LEO constellation known as the Transport Layer. This constellation provides assured, resilient, and low latency military data and global connectivity to meet the DOD's needs. Work has already begun on building these 18 satellites, which are made up of subsystems and components we produce in-house, just like you saw. SDA's approach to building out this constellation favors speed, schedule certainty, and affordability. We've proven ourselves of this across our launches and other spacecraft programs, and are now ready to deliver on this for the SDA. 
We are now six minutes and 18 seconds and counting to lift off for tonight's four of a kind mission. Now tonight's pre-launch operations will follow much of the same process as a standard electron launch you may have seen before. But with today's launch doubling as a recovery mission, it's after liftoff when you can expect to see changes in the mission profile. Two minutes before launch, Electron will switch to internal power and enable its onboard launch safety system called the AFTS, or the Autonomous Flight Termination System. This puts safety control in the hands of the rocket's computer, which has a pre-programmed set of safety parameters that Electron must fly within. Anything outside of those bounds, then the AFTS can issue a command to terminate the mission. Now, Mission Control will call out both of these actions across the nets. At under a minute to lift off, the propellant tanks will be at their optimum pressure levels for launch. Ground control will then confirm the water deluge system on the pad is ready to be activated for when the engines on the rocket ignite for launch. And this is what causes the large white cloud of water vapor that you see at liftoff. Then we get to T minus 10 seconds and the launch director counting down with the launch clock. Then the engines will ignite at T minus 3 seconds and the launch pad's hold down mechanisms will be released for Electron to take flight at T0. Now from liftoff, Electron's first stage will burn for about two and a half minutes, propelling the rocket past supersonic speeds and through a launch milestone called Max-Q, a critical pressure point during ascent. We then come to MECO, or main engine cutoff, when we switch off those nine Rutherford engines and separate the booster from the second stage. When the second stage's sole engine lights up to carry on with the mission, it is at this point that our recovery operations begin for Electron's first stage. After an orientation adjustment, the booster will descend back towards Earth, and we can track its progress through the onboard camera for as long as we can, though be warned that the camera may be expected to cut out at some point during that descent. Now, while all of that is happening, the second stage with Spire and North Star satellites will be going through their own series of events. The rocket's fairing, or the nose cone, will split and fall away, and we'll also hear Mission Control call out battery hot swap for when the second stage's power system switches to new batteries for the engine's motor controllers. At the end of the second stage's seven minutes of flight, we'll have another engine cutoff, and then Electron's kick stage, which the satellites are attached to, will separate. Now, alongside all of that, Electron's first stage will be continuing its journey back to Earth. The first stage is expected to deploy its first parachute at about seven minutes after liftoff. While we might not see that happen on screen, we should still hear the call out from our operators and mission control. This will help reduce the stage to subsonic speeds before the main parachute is deployed at about eight minutes into the mission. Splashdown will then occur at about 10 minutes after that main chute deploys. Once that's confirmed, our recovery team will move in and get to work to bring Electron up onto the deck of their recovery ship, do their initial assessments, and then strap it in for a secure ride back home to land. And again, while all of that is happening, our primary mission will continue. It takes about 40 minutes or so after the kick stage has separated for it to complete an elliptical orbit of Earth. We want to deploy the satellites in a circular orbit, so once this elliptical trip is complete, the kick stage's engine will circularize our orbit. That takes only a couple of minutes before the trajectory is set and the satellites are ready for departure. And then it's about 90 seconds or so to deploy all four Lima payloads because they'll leave their deployers two at a time. We'll have an animation of that payload deployment process to talk you through when it happens. So make sure to stick around or join us again after liftoff for those final moments of the mission. We are now just two and a half minutes away from liftoff of Electron. We're going to hand it over now to Mission Control to take us through the rest of the countdown. And then Muriel and I will be back with you after liftoff as the mission makes its way through those milestones. Go for a kind, go Electron, and go Spire and North. Um, real quick, huge, 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 huge thank you to Jarek, Scott, oh my gosh, uh, holy crap, <laughs> what, and why, and thank you, and you didn't have to do that, thank you for your 14 months of membership, huge thank you, that is insane, um, I just don't even know what to say, thank, thank you, just thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This one's for you. This one's for you. We've got some great questions, guys. I'll, I'll try to get into this um, when we have time. But thank you so much to Jarrett Scott. Let's uh, let's enjoy a beautiful rocket launch together, guys. It's it's getting kind of cloudy and hazy, but it looks awesome. I'm excited. A uh, minute thirty left. I think I got time to. Lock system is in free circulation. Eighty guys airing has been disabled. 
Okay. We'll answer this one real quick. Kyle, yeah, as far as we know, they have abandoned the idea of the helicopter catch, and they're just happy with the ocean recovery as is. It seems to be uh, cheaper and reliable, and they, they think they can get the rocket back in good enough condition to refly it someday, so that's the goal. I do love this shot. That is hard to beat. That wide shot of the gorgeous New Zealand backdrop. Stage one and stage two tanks are pressed for flight. I've got engine purge is enabled. Jared. T minus 30, 30 seconds. Gonna hit the cloud layer pretty quick. T minus 20 seconds and counting. Yes, pointing in the 10, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Lifted off from Rocket Stage Lab one, Launch Complex on. 1 with its Spire and North Star payload. The rocket is on its way to low Earth orbit with those four satellites on board. Now T plus 40 seconds into flight. Electron has begun its pitch over, moving up and on an angle to head away from the launch pad and out over the ocean. Now all is looking nominal so far as the rocket approaches max Q, the moment in ascent when Electron experiences the maximum amount of aerodynamic pressure. Screams. I love the audio too. Clear the next queue. A good call out from Mission Control there that Electron has cleared Max Q. The rocket is now 16 kilometers in altitude and moving at over 2,000 kilometers an hour, which you can track the mission's progress by that telemetry dials at the top right hand corner of your screen. Next up for Electron is Miko, our main engine cutoff, quickly followed by stage separation and the startup of the Rutherford engine on that second stage to continue the mission to orbit. The, the nine engines of the first stage will throttle down and then shut off just before the first and second stages separate from each other. When that happens, the second stage with the Spire satellites will maintain its orbital trajectory and continue on with the mission, while the first stage of Electron will begin its reorientation maneuver to position itself for the return journey to Earth. Now these four events happen in quick succession and are coming up shortly. It's just screaming. 15 seconds to staging. Enter burnout detect mode. Miko confirmed. Yes. That's confirmation stage of two, Miko, confirmed. stage staff, and Rutherford engine ignition on stage two. The telemetry dials at the top of your screen continue to show the speed and altitude of the second stage for the primary mission with the stage two nozzle glowing bright above the stunning Earth. Yeah, that's beautiful. Stage two propulsion nominal. Good. Love to hear it. Fairing jettison succeeded. That was the call for fairing jettison on the second stage, which you saw there for yourself. That means Electron's nose cone has successfully split apart and fallen away. And we do this in preparation for deploying the kick stage with its satellites and to get rid of the dead weight of the fairing now that we are through Earth's atmosphere. 
we have got the trajectory graph showing on your left hand side and on the right hand side which track the stage's current altitude matching the nominal altitude that we need to reach orbit. On the left hand side, Electron's stage one trajectory is on its way to the highest point of its momentum arc. And once it reaches this apogee, the stage's trajectory line should start to come down as its altitude begins to drop to. You are seeing though on your screen that movement of the booster as it redirects to come back to Earth bottom heavy. That way the engines bear the brunt of the re-entry forces rather than shredding the carbon composite at the top of the stage. The, earth, the stage will move quickly as it is pulled back to Earth by gravity and at its peak, the first stage will reach around eight times the speed of sound and generate so much friction that we could see a red-orange glow from the heat as it descends. I love it. Hopefully we get some good video on the way back. Speaking of video, this is a great question from Duckling. It is T plus four minutes and 33 seconds into the mission and Electron's second stage carrying today's payloads remains on course for payload deployment within the hour. Now that second stage is clocking speeds at more than 10,000 kilometers an hour, having now passed 174 kilometers in altitude. For Electron's first stage on its return journey back to Earth, we have had the stage reach its apogee, flip into its atmosphere re-entry position and begin dropping in altitude as it speeds up on its homeward bound trajectory. It will travel this way for a few minutes before its drogue and main parachutes are deployed to help slow it down. So back to how can they be bringing video back without lagging? The answer is of course there's some lag, but most of it isn't from the, the communication. They're only at this point. 200 kilometers in altitude, 100, not even 200 kilometers in altitude, 120 miles, and of course a decent amount downrange too, we'll say double that. So I don't know, they're three or 400 kilometers away from ground-based tracking stations, but that tracking is, is The end RF of stage data. two may look a little different than what you're used to from our previous launches, but this is due to the implementation of BEAST, or our electrical arc suppression system, which ensures all electronics on board can function nominally. In particular, you might notice the addition of a nitrogen tank that maintains pressure within the stage. We're now listening to hear the call from Mission Control for battery hot swap. This hot swap maneuver will allow the continuous energy supply to the Rutherford engine's electric pumps, which deliver fuel to the engine's combustion chamber at extremely high pressure. So the the video feeds are there's just basically, you know, tracking data dishes that that track and transmit data via radio frequencies. There's a battery hot swap. Hot swap successful. A good call from Mission Control, Electron's second stage has completed the battery hot swap. The second stage is maintaining its momentum at more than 15,000 kilometers an hour, now past 200 kilometers in altitude. And we are currently at T plus 6 minutes 39 seconds into the mission and the next critical milestone we are tracking is the deployment of the drogue chute on Electron's first stage. Watch that left hand side of your screen. Jarrett. Oh, oh, look at that video. We'll get back to Jarrett. Thank you. We'll get back FDS to you. has saved. Holy cow. That must, that might be drogue shoot deploy. Hopefully didn't lose it. Whew, that looks so violent. Confirm drug deploy. Confirm drug deploy. I was I was a little nervous, if I'm being honest. It looks so violent. Yes! As you can see on your screen there, a fantastic view that we have the drogue parachute. It has been deployed from that first stage of Electron. We heard that call from Mission Control as well. So that seems like a nominal drogue chute deploy since we haven't heard anything different from our operators. That means we'll move next to the main parachute deploy coming up in around 30 seconds, which we should also hopefully see happen from that live camera feed on stage one. One drogue looks a little bit glonky. Main parachute deploy. Oh, that might have been the main. HVB battery discharge holding nominal. Another great call out from Mission Control, the main parachute on Electron's first stage has successfully deployed. This means the booster's pace will have slowed down significantly and should now be drifting gently towards the ocean. 
It's expected to take around 10 minutes for the booster to reach the water surface, but we'll keep the comms channels up for Mission Control to share updates as they come through. Awesome, that is incredible video. Head to burnout detect mode. Guidance is in terminal, 26 seconds remaining. Now back to the primary mission and we are coming up on the final few seconds of stage two engine burn. We will then have second engine cutoff or seco which shuts down the engine ahead of the kick stage separating for its phasing orbit of Earth. And we're listening out for those events now. Seco confirmed. Stage 3 separation confirmed. <laughs> Looks like the booster's emitting some Great smoke. news from Mission Control with that second stage engine cold and the kick stage separated. We are now in the final stages of this four of a kind mission. The kick stage and Spire and North Star satellites are now in a coast phase around Earth. After that elliptical orbit of Earth is complete, then the kick stage's engine will light up to set the stage and the satellites on a circular orbit before payload deployment. The stage's coast phase will last about 40 minutes or so, and then there is payload deployment before we can call mission success for Electron's 43rd launch. Before we break, though, the latest on recovery is that all is continuing as planned for Electron's first stage and its slow descent to the ocean. Our recovery crew are on standby in the recovery zone, waiting for that splashdown before they can move in and get to work. We'll take a bit of a break now on the webcast, but we will come back to you in a few minutes with confirmation of that booster splashdown when we hear it. So we'll leave the audio channels up so we can listen in for that in real time from Mission Control. Otherwise, we will see you back here shortly. I love it. I love it. And I love that we don't have to worry about copyright strikes because this is my music that's so fun you don't have to worry about it i'm not going to copyright strike myself i'm not going to copyright strike anybody there you go cryo find it on spotify and itunes and wherever you listen to music cryo this is a cool, cool little nerdy little song especially for your music nerds it's, it's in 5-4 but it's over 4-4, four, four, so there's some really weird polyrhythm stuff. Like, throughout, like, where the melody's in 4, and the main part is in 5. So, yeah, enjoy. We gotta get back to our friend Jarrett. Dude, <laughs> what? Come on! Thank you. I don't know why you're being... What's happening? I don't know if you just won the lottery or what, but... Um, probably too loud now, music-wise. Thank you so much. Um, that's crazy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's incredible. Um, yeah, everyone say again, thank you to Jarrett. I saw him say rock on uh, all of us other future loving nerds or something. So Jarrett, this one's to you. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, we've got some great questions here that I'm excited to answer, uh, including uh, this one from Ernest CF saying, what do you think about the possibility of a kick stage on Starship like a Falcon 9 second stage? Falcon 9 second stage probably wouldn't be an ideal kick stage. I mean, you know it'd be a great kick stage. Impulse Space, which is Tom Mueller, who developed the Merlin engine uh, and a lot of other, he was lead propulsion at SpaceX for years and years and years, started his own company called Impulse. He has a methane powered kick stage that he's working with SpaceX already to implement on Falcon 9 missions um, and Falcon Heavy missions. A kick stage like that inside, there will definitely be missions that will utilize a kick stage at some point. You do have some complications because now you have to also load propellant inside of a payload fairing inside. Uh, they said nominal transfer orbit achieved. That's awesome. Um, you do have some complications. Like how do you you know load cryogenic propellants inside of a, a payload fairing and all those considerations. But that was solved. The, the space shuttle was uh, you know supposed to fly Centaur. Uh, did Space Shuttle ever fly Centaur? I don't remember if it did. I think it might have once or twice. I don't actually remember right now. Shuttle Centaur. Can you guys remind me? Um, but yeah, the uh, yeah orbital transfer vehicles exactly like Juan said in our Discord. They're they're popping up everywhere, and uh, 
Yeah, I, there will be kickstages for Starship, I'm sure, because it does not make sense to use the entire Starship really beyond even low... I mean, some GTO missions will make sense, some, but like you won't be able to do a direct-to-geo mission with Starship, but you could do some GTO missions. Um, yeah. Let's, um, let's just talk about a few more of these really good questions here. Um, this is one from, from Chumbi. Uh, would they be able to make an Electron Falcon Heavy? Like an Electron Falcon Heavy, or Electron Heavy, I guess would be the question. With two Electron First Stage boosters and then a Core Electron Booster. Um, I think that's what you're trying to say, an, an Electron Heavy. Um, they could. Uh, I think the reality is a lot of people find that that's actually a lot harder said than done. It's not as easy as just throwing some boosters together. And uh, I, it seems like everyone has tried it. It kind of goes back to, you know what, it's just it's a little easier to scale up the rocket altogether, make a bigger rocket. And that's already what, Electro, what Rocket Lab is doing with their Neutron rocket. The Neutron is already just a bigger medium class rocket. You just, you get kind of diminishing returns when you just try to strap on some additional boosters. It's, you know, you don't get, you're adding, if you think about it, you're making the rocket almost three times bigger, like nearly three times, like 2.5 times bigger by payload mass. You'd think, oh, we get two and a half times more performance. Really, you, you might get like 50% more payload capacity, maybe, maybe twice as much payload. Like you don't get as much as you would think you would get um, for how much more uh, everything scales up and the costs scale up and all that stuff. So um, Neutron is the way forward for, for the company. Um, you know, Electron will still have a, a place for a long time because it's filling this niche of these, you know, launching four satellites, 24 kilograms. You're obviously not going to necessarily put that on a Falcon 9 unless it's on a rideshare mission. Um, but there you go. Um, let's see. This is a question from uh, Ethereal uh, Swordsman saying, would you say that perhaps rotating detonation engines are the most important advancement in chemical engines that we should be chasing? I don't know. I don't know if it is actually the most important. They, they are on, you know, on paper and, and on, in practice, they're, they're efficient. They can gain 10, 15% efficiency. That's fantastic. Uh, they're also utilizing the aerospace effect, which is awesome. I, of course, love that. And uh, just kind of by the nature of the thing, it has to be an aerospike. Just it's, it's annular. It's already a circle with the rotating detonation as the rotating detonation. Basically, if you've ever seen an aerospike, especially one of the a spike nozzle, uh, like a, an annular where it's like a, it looks like a tack, um, then you know that the, the outer ring is obviously a ring. And a rotating, rotating detonation engine, you basically just are constantly actually detonating the propellant. And that's something you generally would avoid in a rocket engine. You don't actually want detonations. Detonations are bad. They can, they will destroy engines. You want a continual clean burn of the engine. Just like knock in your engine. I don't know if you're familiar with like internal combustion engines. Uh, when you have knock, it can, it's tiny little actual, combu you know, detonations. And, um, and it can also be, uh, you know, er premature detonation or premature ignition of fuel before top dead center or before it basically can help make the engine try to go in reverse, which is bad. Uh, but detonations are already by nature supersonic. So they're already, um, there we go. Hello again from Rocket Lab Mission Control. As you might have just heard from Mission Control and seen on your screen, Electron's first stage has just successfully splashed down in the ocean after its return journey from space. We're going to bring that up on screen very soon uh, if we can bring that back from the rocket. But right now, the Electron recovery team are making their way to the stage in the water. They're about 10 minutes or so out. They'll complete safety checks and an initial assessment of the stage's condition before they attempt to bring it on deck of the recovery ship. As we get updates from the team, we'll bring them to you here live on the webcast. Until then, we'll keep an eye out on the recovery vessel and the primary mission with the animated tracking graphic that shows the position of the current payloads above us as four of a kind make their way to their mark with payload deployment starting at T plus 50 minutes. We'll see you back here then. Love it. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. This is awesome. That's so cool. It's really impressive that that booster can just survived you saw brutal re-entry was looking it was starting to tumble 
and it's getting crazy hot. I mean, it's a, it's a nasty environment. And to see this thing just out there, making it look easy, super cool. Uh, let's answer a few more questions that I might call it a night before we get to the circularization because it's it is late for me it's already 1 a.m my time um but no i don't know if if rotating rotate rotating detonation engines are the most important advancement um i think we can get similar gains through things like full flow stage combustion cycle um i don't know it just seems like it's we'll see i mean it, i don't know how well it scales it seems like it's it's a lot heavier uh, thrust to weight ratio wise low power output so far um it might be uh it could be p potentially a really good uh little reaction thruster like you know if, if it's small um could be an efficient way to do um an, an rcs a reaction control thruster um but we'll see uh this is a good question here from morgan will i ever come to new zealand to watch a live launch i would love to i i've thought about trying to do it have looked at it um if I do, I you know I, I want to get down there and just visit some some friends at you know at Rocket Lab, um, you know tr hang out with Liam Lawson because he's a Kiwi. So you know we got uh, the F1 crew out there. You, you gotta you gotta do the cool things when you're in Australia or in New Zealand. I would love to just drive around, uh, go out to the Mahi Peninsula, catch a launch. It'd be it'd be awesome. Um, someday someday I will. This is a good question from um, Astro uh, Knucklehead saying. Uh, potential nuclear disaster aside, could nuclear propulsion clear Earth's gravity well, or is it only feasible in microgravity? So, the biggest problem with with nuclear uh, thermal engines, uh, not uh, not nuclear. So, there's a few different types of nuclear engines. There's also like the you know where you basically just drop a bomb and then just, <laughs> just capture it and and pro propel that way, uh, like the Orion Drive. Not a not definitely not going to do that in uh, in in our atmosphere without causing a radioactive disaster, like you said. But generally, when, when we talk about... Um, generally, when we talk about um, about nuclear propulsion, we're talking about thermal nuclear engines like NERVA, uh, like the RD, what was it, 801 or 901 or whatever it was that was the Soviet one. And um, these nuclear engines are, are pretty heavy because they have a nuclear reactor in them. So they're not very high thrust to weight ratio. Therefore, they don't actually make for very good booster engines. Their thrust is generally low. They're limited on, on heat flux and how much you can drive those, those turbo pumps. We will talk about that in a video someday about nuclear propulsion. But meanwhile, what is going on, you guys? Thank you, Tanda. Tanda Madison, so glad you're staying up and covering Rocket Lab. Thank you. Well, you didn't have to do that. Thank you so much. Jeez, um, thank you very much. Tanda, everyone say thank you to Tanda. Again, I don't know what you guys are doing tonight. Thank you, sincerely. Um, if you're, uh, yeah, this is it's just crazy. Wait, guys, wait until you see what we're doing for IFT3 for tracking telescopes and our, our new systems. It's gonna be crazy. Uh, like I said, all these investments, every everything you guys give just goes right back into to paying for the team and, and wait until you see how we're capturing history. Um, crazy, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, this is from, um, on these things. Um, so yeah, you really, uh, you really don't do, uh, you wouldn't do nuclear propulsion in Earth's gravity well, is the answer. Uh, Brian Green, uh, great question and great job, Tim. And I think that might be, oh, that's, yeah, that's in response to uh, Astro Knucklehead. So uh, thank you very much for that great question. Um, from Step Ver saying, uh, what is the advantage of electric turbo pumps? Is it just simplicity? The, the simple fact is, is if it works and you can get meaningful work out of the, the engine and it's way cheaper and easier to develop, like you said, simplicity, yeah, that's pretty much the answer. You know, it's in pretty much all terms, except for, you know, if you actually look at the ISP, uh, they can perform it pretty much as well as a competitive gas generator engine or even higher potentially. Um, but the biggest problem is that they have to carry the weight of the batteries, the mass of the batteries. And the batteries are, you know, 50 to 100 times less energy dense compared to the propellant that's sitting right next to them. So to do the same amount of work with those batteries, you're automatically adding mass and, and decreasing performance of the whole system as a whole. Um, but they're simple and you can develop an engine in, 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 in 
a low amount of time and you can develop an engine and be flying and flying your customers' payloads and, and getting meaningful work done uh, on a space launch system um, easily and and low risk. That's that's probably the biggest yeah the biggest thing with turbo electric turbo pumps. Great question. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Silence Luffy saying undefined. Thank you very much. Um, and this is uh, Ben E says, I love how these electron launches are getting as routine as a Falcon 9. Almost. I mean, they're not quite as as routine, but they're, I mean, they're definitely the second most <laughs> prolific launch provider uh, from the U.S. at this point. A U.S. launch provider. Even though they're in New Zealand, they're still technically a U.S. company. It's, it's confusing. Um, do they have control and descent from um, NZ Dobbs? Approximately six minutes. Six minutes till acquisition. Cool. We'll, we'll get to that point. Um, from NZ Dobbs, they have any control on descent. So, not so during descent. So we'll use a Falcon 9 for example. Um, I'll keep this pulled up here, ish. Um, they do. They have cold gas thrusters very similar to a Falcon 9 up near the interstage that help flip, and then they maintain orientation using cold gas thrusters, no grid fins, uh, to control it, not to help necessarily with its trajectory, but just simply orientation. They're really truly just trying to make sure that the booster is pointing engines first and maintaining that engine first orientation through re-entry. So that's, um, that's the main thing is, uh, is that. So I don't know about, you know, there is some control, but it's not like, uh, you know, at, it's more just attitude control. Uh, from, from Paul, from Paul, Carl, $50 super chat. What's guys, what are you doing? Thank you. Uh, can you explain how the ocean doesn't wreck the booster? Do they just reuse engines or the whole booster? Thank you, Paul. Seriously, thank you. Uh, really, really appreciate this. Jeez, guys, <laughs> what are you, what are you doing? It's like a Wednesday morning for me. When like early or late Tuesday night, I'm losing my mind. And what are you guys doing? <laughs> thank you, everybody. This is getting ridiculous. Please stop so I can go to bed. Uh, you guys. Okay, Paul. Uh, they do a lot of considerations to try to seal the booster up and make it so it can handle uh, the ocean water and, and the seawater. Um, yeah, generally, obviously, it's it's a bad thing. Um, however, they, they are hoping to reuse a full booster after recovery. So they are, you know, having to do some... There's some engineering trades and challenges to make sure that it can handle... Uh, the ocean water. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, they are, so they've reused an engine once and they're hoping to reuse a full booster at some point. And I, I hope they do get to that point. That'd be awesome. Um, <laughs> um, James, thank you, by the way, James in our, uh, our discord and our, our moderator. Thank you so much for, for helping with, with all this tonight. Uh, get to bed. Uh, from not Heisenberg again, not Heisenberg. How are you? Hey, Tim, we really enjoyed seeing you in Vista for OLF pod years ago. Me and my buddy love those SpaceX tracking shots from earlier today. Can't wait to watch you go to the moon and not Mars. No, I'm not going to Mars. Why don't, don't even joke about it. Cause I used to joke about going to space someday and now it's going to happen. And it's like, what are you guys doing to me? I just, just no, no, but thank you. Not Heisenberg. That was a long time ago. I, I really enjoy doing live shows. Um, I want to do more of these live shows like we did with, with Astro Awards and, and do some more concerts and stuff like that and just have fun. Honestly, I just like being out and about. I like meeting people. I like putting events together and seeing people meet new people, make new friends at events. I just think it's awesome. And uh, that was that was a good one. That was a, a lot of fun. That was a long time ago though. That was what, 2019? Um, was really, really, really fun. Um, Greatly appreciate it. Uh, from Jarrett Scott again, you're going to the moon, dude. How are you not nervous? Of course I'm nervous. I mean, I'm, yeah, I would not say that I'm not nervous. Of course I'm nervous. There's, you know, massive implications. Hey, look at that. Now it's playing Spaceships for Earth by Everyday Astronaut. Let's move that. Maybe we'll catch it. Whee! See, isn't that fun? Isn't it fun when they play? See, this is why I want to do more concerts because I enjoy the music side of things a lot too. It's still a big part of my life and I will have new music someday. Um, but Jarrett, dude, yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm nervous. It's, it's scary. It's, it's a big, crazy thing to do, to go to the moon. Only 27 humans have ever flown to the moon. 
Uh, by the time we fly, you know, there will likely be an Artemis mission or two, so we're looking at a few more, but we're likely going to be the next crew to go to the moon, the first crew to go to the moon on Starship. I hope that they fly that profile a few times before we go to the moon. Um, yeah, it's scary. I mean, I've obviously watched Starship prototypes blow up. I felt that. Um, however, I know that iterative design process is not always a, a simple thing, and it's it can look messy, but it really, truly, I genuinely believe it is the fastest way to develop a system and to get it um, to that curve, that acceleration curve of, of development can be um, exponentially better. If you fast forward 50 years down the road versus you know a more traditional slow approach, the evolution of just flying something and testing it and seeing what happens just leads to continual changes and the fear of, you know, the acceptance of the fact that it could fail can lead to uh, knowledge and then not flying humans or, or, you know, important payload until you get the system to a reliable state. Uh, it's just all part of the certification program. So they won't be flying humans until uh, there's, you know, certification in, involved to make sure everything is safe. So I, I feel I have confidence, you know, SpaceX waited a long time to fly Dragon Capsule, did a lot of insane tests. There is, uh, you know, there's even an issue less than a year or about a year before... You know, they lost a Dragon Capsule during a, an abort uh, test or an abort uh, system test where they're firing up the Super Dracos and they actually blew up a Dragon Capsule down in the Cape. And it was, at the time, considered almost catastrophic. But thankfully, they were doing these tests and doing all these rigorous things, caught that before anything could have happened. And now we see Dragon Capsule is clearly one of the most reliable rides to space. It's been unbelievably reliable spacex i have all the confidence in the world i would fly on dragon in a heartbeat um by the time we're flying on starship i'll have that same confidence otherwise i won't fly in it you know i'm, I'm not out there trying to risk my life uh obviously i'm inheriting some risk by by flying um but you know that's space flight there is an inherent risk there's an inherent risk in snowboarding there's an inherent risk in riding motorcycles there's an inherent risk in a lot of things that we do in life space flight is just one of those but it's it's getting safer. We're continually making improvements. We, the royal we, are making improvements. So, yeah. Uh, again, thank you, Jarrett. You're crazy. Thank you. Um, from Tom uh, Palermo, thank you so much for your super chat. And this is another from RC Horseman. Most of us will not watch a live launch, so here's to give us more views via the internet. Thank you so much, RC Horseman. I promise, I know that, you know, I know we get a lot of I know that there's kind of almost this competitive nature of, of how much coverage there is down at Starbase. And I know, uh, you know, our friends at, at NASA Space Fight and Lab Padre have put together incredibly robust and amazing systems. And, and I watch that all the time. I, w I rely on these systems to keep me up to date with Starbase. And that's important. And I'm not trying to say, but we do, we are doing things in a very different way. Instead of using, you know, 24 hour cameras. scheduled to enable. I didn't quite catch what they just said. You know, we're trying to do things differently. We're literally doing 4K capture from the cameras to your to your eyeballs via your screen, which is actually really hard to do in that remote location. And importantly, we're using cameras. I mean, we're we're getting into Reds now out that we're actually taking out there, uh, high speed cameras. We're using, like I said, every dollar goes straight back into all this stuff, and we're just trying to make it so, in the future, 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road. We have this archive of incredible, you know, milestones and missions that is just out there for public consumption and that we can educate and, and share with the world to help inspire. Official confirmation, stage is intact and floating happily. Official confirmation, stage is intact and floating happily is the word. I love to hear that. Awesome. So they're getting close to it. They're closing in on it. I'll keep the audio up here. Again, RC Horseman, thank you so, so, so much. There's been, I don't know what you guys, why tonight you're randomly super chatting like crazy and, and all that, but again, no, it, it just is all going into, you know, there's a lot Hello of us creators from Rocket doing Lab stuff Mission like this. Control. A quick update for those of you still watching, you are being treated to a live view of Electron's first stage bobbing happily in the ocean as the recovery team prepares to bring it on board. We should see that on your screen shortly. That's awesome. I love that. It's so cool. Uh, but yeah, it, all of you that watch the space community here, it, it's 
only because of your memberships and your, your support, your Patreon support, your Super Chats, that all this stuff is possible. You know this because you see it in the works that is done. So thank you for watching. That's the biggest thing, though. Is we wouldn't be doing any of this. None of us would be doing any of this stuff without you guys watching. So tuning in, being excited with us is so awesome. On that note, I do want to say this to David Hampton, who says, can you explain to my wife why I'm excited to watch every launch? The lo Man, I... I wish I had a lot of energy to really drum up something extremely poetic. But the, the real answer is that this we're living in a time of, of this becoming a new industry where uh, what used to be, you know, um, billions of dollars a year on, on really expensive launch vehicles, we're seeing plucky little companies uh, push the boundaries and try new things and just totally doing things in a different way. You know, SpaceX landing rockets, Rocket Lab recovering boosters and, and trying to reuse them. I mean, you could say that's like the space shuttle, but it's different. We're just seeing rapid evolution. We're seeing um, things and c competition really ramp up and it's it's affecting our daily lives. Starlink is incredible. I mean, Starlink, I've, I use that. We have two Starlink dishes that we require down in, in Texas to make our systems work. Actually, now we're up to like five because we're actually using some other ones during launch day. Um, you know, to be able to have remote access to internet anywhere and soon that'll be on our phones. They've officially sent data straight from a Starlink satellite to your phone. It's changing our lives. We'll be able to have data literally no matter where you are around the world just for a safety perspective alone imagine you know god forbid you're in a car crash in the mountains or something and you're uh far away from any cell phone tower or you're on a boat like this imagine being on this boat and being able to just call your family casually that's the reality we're going to be at oh look at the booster that's so cool ha that baby's been to space it looks good. That's awesome. Go get it, boys and ladies and gentlemen, and anyone on board, <laughs> go get that thing. That's so cool. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the reality is we're just seeing it shape our everyday lives. GPS, data, weather. I mean, all the things, uh, Spaceflight is, is doing this for us and it's pushing technology. Um, it's just, it's just Hello awesome. It's exciting. Lab, it's it's loud, control. it's fast, and it's awesome. I don't know what's happening to my feet all of a sudden. Let's see if we can kickstart this thing. I don't know what happened. Come on, buddy. As you can see on your screen, Electron has made it to space and back and is now... What is going on? Why, why all of a sudden is it buffering? I'm, I got 10 gig internet here. I don't, I don't know if it's on my end or what, but we'll give it a try again. Hello yeah, again from Rocket end. Lab Mission Control. As you can see on your screen, Electron has made it to space and back and is now taking a relaxing dip in the ocean. And from here, our recovery team will hoist. Shoot, yeah, I think it's on their end right now. We'll, we'll let, let them sort it out. This stuff happens. I know this stuff happens. I have all the patience in the world for this. Meanwhile, I'll keep talking to you guys. Millennium, Millennial Falcon, thank you so much for becoming a member. Um, this is a good... Uh, Johnson Lee... Are they using a kick stage because they can't, the second stage can't restart? It seems a bit weird to dedicate. I think that's exactly why, and I never really considered it. They don't have a restart capability. They sh they could if they just put OLED thrusters. Hmm. Ready for the trip back to our production facility and maybe. I mean, restarting, restarting a electric engine is really easy because you just spin the pumps using electricity. You just have to have OLED thrusters first to, to get it you know, moving so you don't, I, th I think they could easily relight if they wanted to. I'm s I don't know if that's the only reason then. I think they actually get a little bit of performance gain out of it. And I'm not sure why or how, but yeah. It's still happening here. I'll keep answering questions <laughs> from Richard. I cried at Tim's going to the moon video. What a guy. Thank you, Richard. Just stand by. I've got a lot of exciting things planned for Dear Moon when I when I do fly. I've got some some really exciting things that hopefully make you even happier. Um, f again, from Millennial Falcon. Hey, Tim, long time viewer, first time member. Keep it up, man. Well, thank you so much. Again, members, uh, stick around. You'll be getting uh, early access here 
uh, next week, hopefully, to the new video to give feedback and, and give it a final watch over before it goes public. It's an awesome video. We're diving into, you know, why don't they just use jet breathing, you know, air breathing engines, jet engines, or air launch, or yeeting a rocket. Um, all these fun things. Uh, really trying to figure out, can we make a better launch system than just a rocket alone? It's kind of part two of the Why Don't They Just series. Um, yeah, so stay tuned if you're a member or a Patreon supporter or an ex-subscriber. Wherever, whatever format you like, you'll that's a, a part of my thank you to you, but also it's just a great way to, to get your voice heard and your questions answered uh, before the video goes live to help catch if there's anything that we missed. So, um, yeah. Uh, speaking of Dear Moon, uh, will while I be attempting to photograph the Apollo sites when I'm on the when I'm on Dear Moon? Yeah, I would love to try. I mean, it, it will take quite a bit of magnification. You'll have to have quite the telephoto lens. Uh, but how cool would that be to see that with your own eyes through through glass? That would be so, so cool. I would absolutely love that. Um, let's see. I think, okay, uh, from Keir Grant, just became a member. Thank you so much. Greatly appreciated. Again, stay tuned. It's going to be some fun things. And here they're starting to get ready to pull a booster up already. I mean, this is impressive how quickly they're, they're at it. Um... <laughs> I will get a big old lens. Don't worry. Maybe even a telescope. How, how sick would it be to take a telescope with you out to the moon and actually observe sites up close? Um, this is cool. Well, guys, I think it's uh, it's one fifteen for me. You guys have been insanely generous. Thank you. And I've got a lot of work to do this week and this week, this weekend, next week to, to get this video done and out. So I think I better just get to bed and try to stay somewhat on schedule, not totally get thrown off schedule here. Um, keep watching this, guys. You can find this stream on YouTube if you want to see them try to pull up the rocket. But I really should just call tonight. It's it's late and I don't want to throw everything off. So thank you guys so much for tuning in with me and congratulations, Rocket Lab. Um, awesome stuff. I love I love these missions. It's so fun to see the recovery. Uh, hopefully it all makes it back and looks good, and I, I hope they refly one this year. That'd be really fun. That'd be a really fun milestone, so. All right, guys. Yeah, I think the, one more reminder, too, uh, before we head out is uh, don't forget to check out our RUD section, our rapid unscheduled discounts. 50% off of some of your all-time favorite shirts. F1 shirt, the Aerospike shirt, Norminal. 50% off. 50, not 15. 50% off. We're clearing up inventory, making room for new stuff. Everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Get yourself something awesome for you or a loved one, including a lot of, uh, we have a lot of youth stuff, including, you know, babies, toddlers, youth, uh, size stuff for sale too. So get over there while it's, while it's in stock. It won't always be in stock. We will sell out and that'll be the last of that stuff. So get it while you can. Love you guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Uh, I'll stream again here. We're, we'll do. A, we'll be doing a, a supporter live stream here soon too. Maybe this weekend. Maybe next next weekend. So stay tuned for that if you're a supporter. But that's gonna do it, guys. Uh, congratulations again, Rocket Lab and everybody involved. Thanks everybody. That's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Bye everybody.